I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, my my favorite element of all of all the the possibilities from the periodic table. Um, my personal favorite is actually the element next door to carbon, um, and that's uh, boron, this little beauty. Um, so you can see the uh, two important numbers associated with boron. You've got the, the number five here, which is, of course, it's atomic number. It's how many protons uh, an atom of boron has. Uh, that's why it's the fifth element. And uh, this, but the second number here is uh, the the total number of the, the total mass, the atomic mass of the of of, a, of the average boron atom, and it's not a whole number. It's ten point eight, which is interesting. That means it's got uh, a number of well, two isotopes. So uh, most of boron is found with five protons and then six neutrons, which would bring up to boron eleven. But 20% of the time, 20%, which is a large fraction for a light element, it has a second isotope, boron-10. And that's a very important isotope, which has all sorts of other um, applications, which I'm going to come to uh, shortly. But um, boron is a, is a really unique element in the, in the sense that it's not made in the usual way. And when I say made, elements the lighter elements in particular, certainly all the way up to, to iron, are made through nuclear synthesis in, in big, in stars. So in the, the cores of stars where we get nuclear fusion, where lighter elements are compressed and they overcome the repulsive forces to squash together and to form new, gradually heavier and heavier elements, all this occurs in the stars. And um, but in, in the case of boron, there's no mathematical way to get to the fifth element. You can't add up the gradually the heliums with more hydrogens with more heliums to eventually get to to boron. So it's really a puzzle that it exists at all. And it exists, in fact, in a similar way to how uranium exists. It requires a supernova. It requires the star to explode to really generate enough energy to, to fragment a lot of the heavier atoms and recombine these elements into other forms. And from these huge events, you can get boron. And eventually that, some of that will, will, will be in the, the nebulous which forms planets like our own. And uh, thanks to that, we have boron as well on this planet. And we find boron on this planet as we find most uh, elements as an oxide. Here's a, a sample of boron oxide. Like most things, it's a, a white powder. Um, but boron oxide has a, um, quite a, a, an interesting history in terms of, of what people have done with it over the ages. So the, these generally salts of boron oxide that we find, they were called bor borax. And the, their first uses were, were found by the ancient Egyptians. And the ancient Egyptians, Egyptians found mines of, of borax in what is today's Turkey. It was then part of the Hittite Empire. And they discovered that these borax salts were very good at desiccating, at extracting, removing water from things. And it became very useful to the ancient Egyptians for the mummification of bodies, uh, in particular pharaohs, of course. And so it became a very expensive and, and important material for this ideal uh, way of desiccating the body quickly, removing the water to ensure a, a perfect mummification process. Later on, um, ancient Romans, they discovered when they were making glass, that's because, of course, glass like this is mainly silicate, so it's mainly silicon oxide, sand, uh, but they found that, well, if you add a little bit of borax, a little bit of boron, then the, the, con the actual properties of the glass somewhat change in that it becomes far less fragile. And in particular, it can cope with huge temperature shocks. So I've just poured here are the coldest substance we have readily avail available for us. And that's liquid nitrogen. So that's minus 196 degrees. And that thermal shock, though, is not enough to make this glass crack. And that's because of the boron that's in this uh, silicon oxide, which is implanted there. If you add a bit of borax salts into the, into the glass mixture when you're heating it up, and that gives this wonderful property. And indeed, to today, 
the uh, the use of of borax salts into various ceramics is a very important and uh, part of its how it's marketed and how it's sold into the current days you know markets and how boron figures in our in our industries but what i want to concentrate on today is something that happened in 1912. you see 1912 is a year that if you've seen the film titanic uh, where the the great ship titanic sank and on that same year well there was a person who did a remarkable bit of chemistry he managed to replace the oxygen in these borax salts with hydrogen and form thus the first boron hydrides or, or boranes. And in fact, my first question to you this today is which chemist synthesized the first boranes in 1912? Anyway, the uh, the chemists who did uh, who did manage to do this, he discovered really a new boom in inorgan inorganic chemistry. This is the gentleman here, Alfred Stock, a genius. He also did some amazing. His supervisor, PhD supervisor, was Emil Fischer. He did some amazing work in organic chemistry. He also announced to the world that uh, it's a shame that the that our planet has this remarkable process of photosynthesis, which is unique to carbon, which turns the oxide of carbon, carbon dioxide, into a hydride of carbon, hydrocarbon, and hydrocarbons, which of course are the, the be all and end all of organic synthesis of our beginnings and life and color and everything on this planet. And he was keen to set his PhD students, the best of which was Alfred Stock, to look into these other elements, are there other elements that can form a series of hydride compounds? And Alfred Stock came up with the hydrides of boron, the boranes. Now you've seen in the previous talk, some of the structures that carbon makes, they tend to be these flat um, ring-like or chain-like structures. Well, Alfred Stock realized and found out that boron with its hydrides form these amazing three-dimensional, very beautiful, what are called polyhedral structures. Here's a 12-vertex icosahedron. And so these boranes suddenly began to increase in their number, more and more synthesized, and they realized that boron, after carbon, is the element which has the greatest potential to form hydrides. I want to talk about and show you what some of these hydrides can do. Okay, so here I've got, um, what I'm going to do is going to put this little dish in front of me here. I've got a, a small amount of uh, boron hydrides here dissolved in uh, in some, in a solvent, and I'm going to pour it out here onto my plate carefully, because in the same way as hydrocarbons are very useful to us as fuels, well, it didn't take long before the boron hydride chemists discovered that uh, boron hydrides also oxidize in air. But when they do so, and I hope you can see that nicely, it gives a wonderful big, big difference to if I, if I burn carbonaceous materials in oxygen, we get this orange flame. Whereas here, if I take the boron hydrides, they give a wonderful green flame. Now look at that. And often actually when the first during uh, the, some of the major projects which were developing boron hydride chemistry, they called those projects the Green Dragon. Now, it didn't take long before they recognized they could calculate how much energy is being given off via this oxidative process with boron hydrides compared to carbon hydrides, which were the fuels of the day. And they realized that, and they calculated, and they, they also measured that this oxidation process of the boron hydrides is giving off much more energy per unit volume than if I use hydrocarbons. Well, that led to a big boom, what happened next? Because you see, now we're talking about the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, and it was all about, let me get this the right way around, it was all about trying to find rocket fuels. 
So here in the Czech Republic, in Zesh, where I have my labs, there are some top secret research works looking into the boron hydrides as a potential new rocket fuel. Now, uh, I'm going to show you what, how we can go from an oxidation process, an easy one, such as we've just seen here with the burning of boron hydrides, and ramp it up to actually get a rocket propulsion. It's not actually that difficult and something you can do in your schools or even at home if you're very courageous. And indeed, you don't need a lab like mine to be able to make the boron hydrides. Borax, the salts of boron oxide, can be found in, in many different um, products that we find at home. They're often in, in washing powders, for example. And if you dissolve uh, borax, salts of boron oxide, in alcohols, you can form these bor boron esters, which have a similar effect if dissolved then and burnt in alcohol, you'll also get that nice green flame. Now, in any oxidation process, especially with the boron hydrides, which are releasing its energy, which are in these bonds, so you've got the you've got your boron hydride uh, molecules, which have these wonderful polyhedra. All the energy is trapped inside these bonds. And when you get oxygen coming through, you begin the burning process, you're forming new molecules of, of boric acid, boric, boron oxide, and water. And that reaction is very quick, very fast. All the, all the old bonds, bonds are breaking and new bonds are being formed. And that's releasing the energy difference between the older bonds and the new bonds as the energy that's being released. And if that reaction happens quickly, then we get a big expansion of gases which are being produced. And that expansion of gases can act as a reactor force and a propulsory, a propulsion force for a rocket. So all we need to do really to make a rocket and make some rocket fuel is to have the right chemistry as we have here. And then you just need to force those new molecules of gas that have been formed to go through a small area and therefore create a propulsion force. So this is essentially all you need to make as a rocket. You just need a bottle uh, with a, a cap. Now, the cap, I've just put a hole in, in the middle there. Can you see the hole there? You can see the hole there, right there in the middle. Well, that, that hole is what I'm using to really confine, to, to confine the space to force these molecules that have been formed inside our rocket to come through, to really push through this confined area to come through. So that's how I can get the, the propulsion force. Then, uh, so inside my rocket, all I do is I put a bit of fuel. I don't need much at all. I'm going to shake it a bit. I'm going to use my, my hand just to warm this borane uh, alcohol mixture up, just to get the, the, the transition to vapors, so it's mixing with the air a bit better. On the top here, I've just sellotaped a, a simple straw because I'm gonna use that to guide the, the way my rocket's gonna fly. And I've got along here a simple piece of string, push it through like that. Okay, now I just need to empty my bottle of the remaining fuel carefully onto the floor. I'm gonna go back over here. Okay, it's all tight and ready. Now, hopefully you can still see this. I'm gonna take my, my fuel over here. I'm gonna take my lighter. Are you ready? Can you see it all? Ready? Count down. Three, two, one. So that's it, we got the propulsion that we needed. That rocket really did fly. I only needed a very small amount of my fuel, the borane fuel. And I want to explain though how eventually the boranes didn't become the rocket fuel of choice. And that's for the following reason. When I burn hydrocarbons in oxygen, I form carbon dioxide and water, both of which are gases that can leave the engine, the, the, the rocket, uh, without any 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 sort of deposition of anything. Whereas when I'm burning boron hydrides, I'm forming water, but I'm also forming something else. I want to show you it here. Here, can you see it on the camera? See that white? That's, that's boron oxide. So the oxide of boron, 
Whereas the oxide of carbon, carbon dioxide, is just a, a gas that would leave the engine of the, of the rocket. Well, when we use boron fuels, the problem is you get accumulation of boron oxide. And it's a white powder. And that white powder will eventually stop the rocket from working. So you get a lot of initial energy and a lot of initial acceleration, which is superior to normal rocket fuel. However, the accumulation of this white powder destroys the actual trajectory eventually. Nevertheless, I think even Elon Musk's X, X space X biggie rockets, they do use a little bit of borings at the beginning to get the initial thrust. But to finish with, I want to show you, of course, today's rocket fuel that's used. And today's rocket fuel is <laughs> almost today's rocket fuel is none other than almost broke the dishes there. There's another end of what I've got over here. Here we go. This is today's rocket fuel. It's, of course, hydrogen gas. And hydrogen gas gives a wonderful oxidative reaction, which you are very much, you're going to know, and you'll probably be familiar with. Let me just position this balloon in the right place. Let's get it onto the, the floor. Here we go. Now, this don't try at home, kids. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to just show you the real rocket fuel of today. It is, of course, oxidizing hydrogen to give water and a lot of energy. Three, two, one.